When the gospel is unpopular, men need it most. But when it seems that things are going well, morals are improving, the church is extending, men also need the gospel most at that time. How easily our hearts are turned to ourselves in pride, self-righteousness, hopelessness at one point, or overconfidence at the other. What were these days in which these prophets minister? Nahum, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, as we'll see at another time. These were days initially under the reign of Josiah when things seemed to be going well. God had brought a man after his own heart to the throne. The discovery again of the word of God, the opening of the temple, a heart that was transformed by God's word that was established in the heavens. And his word standing firm was something that began again to transform lives. But the question was, was the Reformation just the fashion of the moment as it had been in the past, on Hezekiah's days and others? Or was it something that was thoroughgoing through the hearts and minds of the nation? People turning away from the high places, turning away from the Baal worship, turning away from their household gods and their abominations and perverted practices. A heart of a people truly crying out to God, show grace to us, pour your bounty upon us. But God knew the heart of the people, that they needed the proclamation and the regular proclamation of God's holy word to them. In Josiah's work, God did not leave him alone, but encouraged him with these men who were called to authenticate the word, to back up what Josiah was doing in the will of God. God would be pleased by a nation repentant and faithful before him. What do we see here as we look at this familiar first passage in the book of Jeremiah? Here we have the call of Jeremiah. Something with similarities to Isaiah chapter 6. A call to a man who felt so humble before the presence of the glorious God. So unable to proclaim the word. But God touched his lips and he was speaking a word from God. This word from Jeremiah was not to be seen as Jeremiah a prophet of doom and gloom. But one who was a prophet of hope. And particularly to the faithful people of God that there was a purpose in what God was going to do. And in their faithfulness he would bring them back to the land. Being with them in exile in Babylon. But looking at this passage completely we see firstly that the word must be declared in difficult times. But these seem good times. These seem the very times when they didn't need a prophet coming, preaching repentance because things seemed to be going well. The temple was being tidied up and opened again. The proper religious practices were taking place. Jerusalem was being tidied up from its vice. Internationally, Assyria was on the run and, and hadn't it been promised that Nineveh would be destroyed? Already Assyria was constrained by its enemies and even in the reign of Josiah, Nineveh would be, be crushed. These were days of reformation. Babylon was busy. So it seemed that these were moments of Judah's independence. Here was civil and religious liberty. The ability now to do as they pleased. But we must be careful as we think of God granting civil and religious liberty. It is liberty to please God, to serve him, both in the civil realm and the religious realm. It's not liberty to do as we choose, to follow the patterns and fashion of the ages. God was concerned about his people. 
God was looking on and the nations were also looking on to the land of Judah. What would he do? How would this nation express its covenant history under that covenant God? How would it deal with what God had already said to them that his wrath would not turn away and they would be carried into exile? These were days when many in their hearts were yet pleasing God. Outwardly, there were signs of reformation, but their hearts in many cases were just as hardened as before. We look back to the great days of reformation in the history of the church. They were times when the truth of scripture was recovered and people were shedding their blood for Christ. There were many martyrs of the church. There was much study of God's word and great literature was written and the Bible was translated faithfully into many languages. But it also was a time when many people took the word of God wrongly, took their religious fervor sinfully, and it was a time of religious strife and warfare and many things that do not show the work of Christ in their hearts. Times of reformation are also dangerous times when people stray from the word of God. Such were these days in Josiah. Many seeking to follow what was going on in the royal court, to follow the fashion, and yet with one eye on the international realm. How could I comply with what was happening in other nations and then comply with the cultural change in my own nation? Well, Jeremiah was one called by God to direct the people from the word of God spoken to these people in the streets and the cities and the towns and villages throughout the land of Judah. And he was speaking the message of God in these difficult times. But the call of God came upon this man, Jeremiah. He was of the priestly order he was from this town of Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, which was always associated there with Judah. The, the two are, are seen together and often just called Judah. But he was a man called to go into every place. He would have been coming to the towns with a message. And obviously he also came into the royal courts with a message, as we'll see later in the book. But he was a man Fearless in the word of God, but humble in his own heart and fearful of his own lack of abilities. But take this message. Men need to hear this message. Wherever it is, just don't keep it in the temple courts. Don't keep it in the theological schools. People need to hear this. If God is transforming a nation or calling them to repent, they need to hear the word of God preached. As we thought of the end of Zephaniah, the promise was to these people that just as no one will escape the day, the day of the Lord, God's people will not escape the grace of the Lord. So there is this word that builds up the people of God, that comforts the people of God in the times of trial and judgment they were facing. But hearing the word of God in the unrepentant heart it was uncomfortable. As Josiah was seeking under God and growing in his understanding of Scripture with good and wise counselors, there was a change taking place. But God kindly in his grace bagged up this work by preachers of the word and in a manner that addressed directly the heart. So it wasn't just an outward reformation. It had to be that that was from a change in heart and mind, coming humbly before God. Jeremiah knew that God was watching the land of Judah, watching the one who was on the throne, watching the people of the nation, watching the nation surround as he was a prophet, prophesying about surrounding countries. But he was the one who sought the love of these people for himself. And his ministry as had begun. The word of the Lord came to him and came with a vision. 
that of the branch of an almond tree and that of a boiling pot facing away from the north. How was he to understand these two visions? Well, the picture of an almond tree, a bare branch that blossoms suddenly in the springtime. Then it comes fully into its pink blossom and then following the fruit. But as the commentators say that the word for almond tree also sounds like watching. So as the people were watching for the work of God. God was watching the nations. And these people were, were also to see and to expect what God was going to do. And what was he going to do? Well, there was a boiling pot. This boiling flood of God's wrath was coming from the north. The Babylonians were going to come. Come by that road from the north and come down into the land of Judah and bring the work of God to that nation, the chastising work. They would come, they would besiege Jerusalem, they would besiege the, the city of the cities of Judah. The nations and the allies of Babylon would come, they would set up their camp. This was a definite promise of God. So how was God addressing these people? What was the point of repentance? What was the point of doing anything if judgment was going to come and the day of the Lord was going to sweep everything away? Remember what God had said through Zephaniah. There is a place of safety even in the day of the Lord for those who know him and respond in repentance and faith. Just likewise for us, it is a picture of that last day and the coming of Christ. There is no condemnation for those who are safe in Christ Jesus. There is that grace that is poured out unto us, undeserving that when the fullness of his wrath comes upon this earth, this creation, and it is all carried away, also with all the evildoers, we will stand firm in Christ, clothed in the new flesh for the new creation. These words from the prophets over these last generations were directed that God was bringing his wrath upon these people. But there was a rescue. There was safety for those who would call upon the Lord. That even they would be carried into exile or they would find refuge in the land of the Philistines or among the Egyptians. God would be with his people, not forgetting his covenant. He wouldn't destroy them utterly, but he would bring them back, chastised, repentant, redeemed to this land for the renewed work of the Lord and the testimony to God. But he would remove from them the temptations, those things that had proved to be the snares, the secret gods that they had stashed away in their houses, the places of remembrance where their idols had been set in the temple courts or in the street corners or on the hilltops. Judah would be wiped clean that they would be coming back to a land without these snares that would draw them away again to sin. But these were blessed moments in which Jeremiah began his ministry. A moment when people had this liberty to proclaim the word of God and to serve him and please him. I think of many times in the work and life of the church when there have been windows of liberty before times of persecution came. Notably in recent history we think of, of times of liberty in lands, whether it's in lands in Africa. Or great revivals that took place in, in China or in North in Korea before the communist takeover. There were times when the church was strengthened. There were times when it was prepared for persecution that came and God was gracious. But yet his wrath still came upon the nation. But the church was prepared. We have yet days of liberty to proclaim the word of God. We have that liberty to reach out, to do outreach in our land, to proclaim the truth of the gospel. There are always 
our days of trial ahead. Are we ready? Are we taking the opportunity, speaking for the Lord, and proclaiming the great news of hope in a world of hopelessness? Complacency is that great danger in the church. Whenever persecution comes, we then are overwhelmed and we fade away. The danger was in these days of Reformation that people were careless. They thought, God will not send the judgment. Perhaps he will relent in our generation and we will see through our days in times of peace. We'll be able to go to the temple. We'll be able to go to our feasts. I will not really have to think too much about serious repentance and sanctification. We'll just carry on with the flow and, and God will be pleased by outward compliance. In the flood of judgment that was coming, people needed the strength of God in their heart. They needed strong faith that God would see them through. And what was happening was also in the purpose of God. Now serious as the examination was yet there of God against this nation. Verse 16, God says, Look, I will utter my judgments against them concerning all their wickedness, because they have forsaken me, burned incense to other gods, and worshipped the works of their own hands. And no doubt some of the works of their hands was the outward superficial reformation for God. We've tidied up our lives. We've tidied up the temple. We have hidden the gods out of public view. But so many people's hearts were still filled with pride and distracted from the true and living God. Jeremiah, as we see looking on at his word and prophecy, was one calling people back to truth. And how easily people did just a little for the Lord seeking to please themselves, but were ever challenged by the preachers and the prophets declaring the truth of God. It has to be a wholehearted response, a wholehearted repentance, wholehearted faith and reformation, not something that just complies with the pattern and fashion of the day. Pictured for us also here in the work of the prophets, is the ongoing work of the church, where we are called to be prophetic in our own day, to speak the word of God to the people of God, that we might be challenged, that we might be encouraged, that we might build up one another, but that we might be ever ready for the challenges that the church faces in difficult times. Well, there are not these similar type of prophets, of course. But as a nation and as a people have to repent, as Scripture is clear, as we think of Paul writing, how shall they hear if there are not preachers sent? We must pray for men to preach the word. Pray for those who would prophetically proclaim the word of God. Not in the matter that we're, we're thinking of often as we look at Old Testament prophets. Their work was not always thinking of the future. It was addressing the word of God to the moment. The hearts of the people that were there building upon the truth of God and his revealed character in the past. And that's exactly what Jeremiah is doing because already God has promised what he is doing, bringing them to Babylon, and then he will return them to the land of Judah. But these godly people of Judah were longing to hear the word of encouragement. In that generation before, during the ministry of Isaiah and others, no doubt, in the time of Manasseh, they were very dark days in the land of Judah. Days when the people of God could not outwardly live for their God. They were fearful to worship the true and living God. And there were real persecutions unto death. They were praying for those who would preach to them the word. They were seeking the encouragement. 
They were longing for better and brighter days and longing that their nation would truly repent from its sinfulness. Do we long that God would speak plainly to the church, that he would expose the sins of the church, that he would also reveal himself and his power in the life of his people? If we want him to, to expose the sins of the nation or the sins, we, we have to see the sins of the church exposed. And we have to see our own sins reveal that we will come in repentance, that we will truly be transformed if we're longing the nation to change, if we're longing the church to be revived. We have to pray for that and seek that earnestly and honestly in our own hearts. That praying that we would hear the word, that we would read the word, but that we will open our hearts for it to be applied to our lives to bring its transforming work. God called people from surprising places. How many of the prophets came from obscure towns? They, they weren't from the city. They, they weren't from noble families. They were from places that their names have passed into obscurity. We don't even know where some of these villages were. But God brought these people forth for a moment. Sometimes for a single prophecy that is recorded in a few chapters. A specific moment in history or like Jeremiah or like Isaiah over a prolonged period of time. But God is faithful providing the messengers of the word of God and the preachers of the word of God for the church. But the contrast was to Jeremiah. Yes, he was of the priestly order. Not all the prophets were of the priestly families. But what a contrast there was we'll see going on to the, the professional prophets in Jerusalem. We're familiar with how, what they were crying in these days. Crying out to the people what they wanted to hear. Peace, peace. And God said there was no peace. They were professional in their calling. They sought to please men. They liked their position. They were little more than yes men or soothsayers. They were plausible. They were believable. And they didn't really challenge the heart because they weren't speaking the word of God. What were their own hearts and lives like? Well, we cannot judge that in that sense. But they weren't proclaiming the truth because God wasn't revealing it to them. They weren't speaking the word of God as were these prophets that God had called and raised up for his purpose. The glaring problem was, of course, the resistance in the heart of the Jewish people to the transforming work of God's word. This is a word that smashes the pride of men. It is like a two-edged sword penetrating deep. They're severing us from our most deeply head, held sin like in a surgical motion. This is the power of the word of God that is proclaimed by these prophets. And that's how we know that they are true prophets. That they're revealing the word of God and also the word of God that they proclaim comes to pass. The history of the church is full of false prophets called by pride called by ambition called some by, sometimes by the circumstances they're, they're just a, a religious type person and, and they're pushed into this type of office sometimes they're called by culture their experience some of them are deceived in their hearts some of them are just plainly sinful in their motivations Seeking glory for themselves or at best being deluded, deluding other people like the blind leading the blind. But they do not bring the consistent message of God from his word. They are seeking new revelations of their own design. New truths or new things they say that God is doing. And as the spirit of Antichrist was there in the New Testament church that they came out from among them and drew people away from the truth of the Lord Jesus. 
This is a danger in our day, as it was in the days of the apostles and the days of the prophets. But we live in special days, because we live in a day when the revelation of Scripture is complete. So we can discern very easily those who are true preachers and true prophets of the Word of God. Because they're not preaching themselves. They are preaching the Word of God. They're not preaching their own ideas or some new philosophy or some new revelation they claim they've received in a vision. It has to be fixed and rooted in the complete Word as it is preserved for us in Scripture. Likewise, preachers of the church are not prophets in that Old Testament sense. Revelation is complete, and we have all sufficient for life and godliness. This is what we declare. Jeremiah was one who proclaimed that same consistent message. Through time, the thread was there right through Scripture that pointed to Christ that pointed to the work of redemption. It didn't point to men as individuals, didn't point to movements. It pointed to God's plan of salvation. Through the shed blood, there is the forgiveness of sins. So the call to mankind is repent and believe. Yes, Jeremiah was a preacher, but he was also conscious of his own humble calling. How do we think of those who are proclaiming the word that we're not led astray? Well, thirdly, as we think perhaps of the first passage in this chapter, preachers must know that they are weak men. We do not like pride. We do not like preachers who are self-assured and arrogant in their own abilities. We are thankful for the abilities that some men have been given in an exceptional sense. But we see here one who was faithful to the calling of God. And he came humbly saying, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. He didn't presume himself to, to speak to people who were older than him, proclaiming to priests, speaking to the the other priests speaking to those in authority, speaking even to the king, let alone the people in the towns and cities that he was visiting. So he was one who knew his own weakness and position in society. But God was saying, look, you've been set apart for this task. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I ordained you. I've sanctified you to be a prophet to the nations. Well, the call of God is always a difficult thing to ascertain. But yet here we see it verbally explained to Jeremiah. But in those who are the preachers of the word, it is seen worked out in their life. Moses was a man who was called to be a prophet. Having been a prince, having been a shepherd in the wilderness, called to be a prophet of God. But where he said he couldn't speak. Perhaps that was lack of faith and God in his grace allowed Aaron to speak for him. But here was God saying to Jeremiah, you will be speaking my words. Does Christ not say that to the disciples? Fear when you're in a difficult position, God will give you what to speak. And Jeremiah was such who would speak and proclaim faithfully the word of God. But it was seen through his life how he was tested, how also God said to him, you will be like a a fortified city, an iron pillar, and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes and its priests, against the people of the land. They will fight against you. They shall not prevail against you, for I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. Of course, this man was exceptional in this position as God has called him, But he knew his own weakness. And in humility, he realized that anything that he did was by the strength of God alone. But God does call the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. 
Yes, we thank God for those proclaimers of the word that are, are highly gifted and, and they are exceptional. But such is accompanied often by many dangers for preacher and congregation. But we thank God for yet there is proclamation of his word in these days when we have the liberty to do so. And we must pray for that and pray for the work of God calling men to preach his holy word. That people will hear. People will be encouraged. People will respond. People will be prepared for greater tribulation in days ahead. But pray that men would know their own weaknesses and rely upon the Lord. Rely upon the strength of God because the gospel is all about the inability of men but the ability of God to redeem, to, to save and forgive. The gospel is unpopular in any time. In times of great opposition, it is unpopular. In times of reformation, it can be unpopular because people think we're okay. We're working it out ourselves. We don't really need any further word from God. We'll manage all right. But men must hear the whole counsel of God and it must be declared to them faithfully by those who are preaching the word of God. In days of darkness or days of reform and transformation, God is the one who addresses the heart. And that word is addressed by God the Holy Spirit. Pray that God would provide for his church preachers of the word. Pray that God would keep those preachers humble and faithful in the word of God. Pray that God would protect his word from those who would draw people aside into error the false prophets proclaiming themselves in sin and pride. And pray that men's hearts will be open to the transforming work of God's word, a powerful word, a word that is established in the heavens, but has been brought to us even in that living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.